This episode of Sabaton History is about one of the darkest chapters in human history. This is the final solution. It happened on November 9th, 1938. The National Socialist leadership of Germany had gathered in Munich to commemorate the Beer Hall Push, Adolf Hitler's failed attempt to grab power 15 years earlier. Then the news arrived that Ernst von Rath had succumbed to his wounds. He was a young German diplomat who had been shot in the German embassy in Paris by Herschel Greenspan, a Polish-German Jew. Joseph Goebbels, German propaganda minister, now addressed the party officials and spoke vividly of a global Jewish conspiracy that aimed to push Germany into a war with France. Outraged, the men rushed to the telephones and urged their local Nazi henchmen to act. What followed was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass a nationwide pogrom against Jewish communities in Germany. A thousand synagogues and prayer rooms were vandalized or set on fire. 7,500 shops were wrecked and looted. Jewish neighborhoods were attacked and 90 Jews were killed. It was the climax of years of anti-Jewish policies and harassment. Adolf Hitler's chancellorship had turned anti-Semitic rhetoric into state policy. Since mid-1935, Jews faced increased harassment. Under Reinhard Heydrich, the German Security Service, SD, began monitoring Jewish organizations and affairs more closely. To the Nazis, Judaism was not only totally alien to German culture, but also the natural enemy of National Socialism. Hitler believed in an international Jewry that pulled the strings behind both Soviet Bolshevism and Anglo-Saxon capitalism, and Germany must free itself from their influence once and for all. For the Führer's planned cleansing of the Reich, Heydrich recruited Adolf Eichmann, a former desk worker at Dachau concentration camp. It would be his job to implement the stricter policies aimed at excluding Jews from the German economy and everyday public life. By making their lives as miserable as possible, they would push the Jews to voluntarily emigrate from the Reich. They were not to feel welcome nor safe in Germany, and public opinion was to be swayed accordingly. Over the following years, Jews were denied entry into theaters, into cinemas, museums, and restaurants. They were banned from using public transportation and even owning bicycles. Shopping was restricted to one hour a day, and there was a strict curfew in the evening. And Jews were not allowed to buy certain things like cigars or flowers. They were not allowed to own telephones or typewriters either. They eventually had to wear a yellow badge to visibly differentiate themselves from everyone else, and they paid extra taxes. The Nuremberg Racial Laws of 1935 were set in place to legally segregate the Jews. Citizenship was restricted to people of German blood. Jews were reduced to mere subjects of the Reich without political rights. They were fired from the civil service. Teachers and professors were ousted. Jewish-owned shops were attacked. The Hitler Youth Organization chased Jews out of public spaces. The laws were so strictly enforced that even the smallest misconduct could lead to imprisonment or worse. Jews lived under a constant fear of inspections, house searches, and death threats. And then Kristallnacht happened. Hitler, however, was furious at Goebbels about inciting all the violence in the streets. An unregulated mob roaming the streets not only discredited Nazi authority, but also had a sobering effect on the German people. Many bystanders were shocked by the uncontrolled violence and the lawless behavior of the mob. Worse for Hitler, they felt sympathy for the Jews that were manhandled and humiliated by the Nazi party members. Hitler actively forbade any such organized pogroms in the future. The Jews, he insisted, were to be expelled from Germany through laws and edicts and detained far from the public eye. Over the next months, Jews who had broken the laws were sent to concentration camps, to Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen, which had previously housed political prisoners and actual criminals. Now the majority of the inmates were Jews. The fate of the Jews was to be tightly bound to Hitler's ambitions. 
On the road to war, the Fuhrer stylized himself as something of a prophet. In his speeches, he repeatedly warned of international Jewish influence and that if the Jews would steer Germany into another world war, then they would not survive to see its end. It seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy, as by December 1941, Hitler had invaded the Soviet Union and declared war on the United States, but his belief in the international conspiracy remained, and his war became a war against Jewish life itself. On December 20th, 1941, in a villa outside Berlin, the Wannsee Conference began. Prominent Nazi party members met with officials from the Reich Main Security Office and from the occupied territories. Here, they would decide once and for all how to answer their Jewish question. The discussions were to offer, quote, clarity on questions of principle and the, quote, preparation of the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. Emigration was not enough anymore. The war had changed Judenpolitik to something far, far more sinister. Authority over the final solution was given to the SS. Its leader, Heinrich Himmler, envisioned first Europe-wide deportations of Jews from the west to the east. Eichmann's office was ordered to prepare the removal of hundreds of thousands of Jews from Germany, Austria, Bohemia, and Moravia to the overcrowded ghettos of Eastern Europe. Since the war began in September 1939, the Jews of Galicia, the Vaterland, and Poland, organized as the General Gouvernement, had been forced to live in segregated residential districts. But even though they were impoverished and cramped together in appalling living conditions, these Jewish communities survived. The final solution was to deny them even that. SS doctors now came into the ghettos to sort the residents into two categories. The first category was for young and healthy Jews who were able to work for the German war effort. The second was for those that could not, the old, the weak, the sick. These people were to be liquidated. The regular concentration camps had already improvised special treatment programs. That is a euphemism for the outright murder of Jews that could no longer work. Jews that were sent from the Woj ghetto to the Chelmno camp were herded up a ramp and through a door. Behind that door, they entered the dark back compartment of a gas van. On their drive to a remote location, the men and women were asphyxiated, either with bottled carbon monoxide gas or exhaust fumes piped into the compartment. Once they reached the designated burial ground, a group of Jewish prisoners was ordered to drag the dead from the van into excavated pits. At the end of the day, those workers had to enter the pit as well and were shot dead. The Belzec death camp was the first installation for mass murder on an industrial scale. Belzec was enclosed by fences of barbed wire, and watchtowers, and when trains full of Jews arrived, usually an SS officer stood in front of the crowd and reassured them that they would only remain in Belzac for a short time. They would now have a shower and receive their valuables and other belongings afterwards. Undressed, the men walked first into a long corridor, walled off by barbed wire. Now it was there that the Ukrainian guards took over from the Germans. Chronic shortages of manpower forced the SS to rely on multitudes of foreign auxiliaries, known as Hevies or Troniki men. Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, Latvians, and Poles were recruited to serve as guards at the extermination camps. Armed with bayonets, clubs, and whips, they broke any resistance with terrifying violence. The gas chambers themselves were crude, simple buildings, four by eight meters long, two meters high, with double wooden walls. Essential was the airtight rubber-sealed door, which also had to be strong enough to resist any strong force from within. Several hundred prisoners were pressed into the small space of the gas chamber. Once the door shut behind the crowd, the lethal exhaust fumes from a dismounted Soviet tank engine 
were piped into the chamber. The men were so tightly packed that when the doors were again opened, the dead stood in an upright position, mouths slightly open, with their hands often pressed against their chests. The women went next, after fellow prisoners came to cut off their hair to be used for industrial purposes. By then, it must have dawned on many of the women what fate awaited them. The SS men also didn't care that the guards raped many of the young girls before sending them into the gas chamber. The dead were buried in large pits concealed from the train station, and Jewish workers tidied up the station platform before the next train arrived. There was a country in depression. There was a nation in despair. One man finding reasons everywhere. Then there was rising hate and anger. The pure sword is still applied. Who was to be blamed and sent to die? The final solution was a vicious cycle. Ghettos were refilled with Jews from Central Europe as the former inhabitants were sent to either labor camps or condemned to death. Each wave of roundups meant a death sentence for tens of thousands of Jews. As the SS grew in power over civil administration, the classifications changed, and more and more Jews were marked for death. New extermination camps were built as well. Treblinka, Majdanek, and Sobibor. Treblinka had little of the clean and deceptive murder machine the Nazis first envisioned. The massacres often started right at the train station as the Jews were alerted to their impending fate by the corpses lying on the ground. The camp simply killed people too fast to hide its purpose. It is estimated that Treblinka killed around 4,600 people a day. That's nearly 200 per hour every hour. Auschwitz became the last place designated as an extermination camp, though it had been in use since early in the war as a terror camp for Polish officials and dissidents. In July 1942, it was incorporated into the final solution. While Auschwitz I was to remain mainly a concentration camp for forced labor, a second Auschwitz camp at Birkenau would experiment with new extermination techniques. The first gas chamber there opened in March 1942, and it was outfitted with crematoria for disposing of the corpses of the dead. Once the prisoners were inside the gas chambers, SS men wearing gas masks would remove the covers of the ceiling vents, opening cans of Zyklon B poison. The body heat of the people pressed into the chamber caused the Zyklon B crystals to vaporize releasing hydrogen cyanide gas. The Jews painfully choked to death on the fumes in minutes, even seconds. Auschwitz was also the place where German doctors experimented with mass sterilization of many Jews that were not destined for immediate extermination. What had begun in 1935 would find its terrible conclusion in that year of 1942. The Nazis envisioned a final solution that would exterminate Jewish life in Europe. And as long as the war was fought, as long as the Nazis remained in power, and as long as the camps remained open, the Jews would suffer and die. The final solution was the darkest chapter in German history, and one of the darkest in our world's history. And the Holocaust is vital to be remembered as both a commemoration for its victims and as a warning to future generations of the depths to which humanity can sink and the atrocities that man can commit against his fellow man if the darkness and the hatred in some human souls is left unchecked and allowed to grow and fester. Power, you've, you've been to Auschwitz. I've never been there. I haven't been there yet, but you guys have been there, yeah? 
Yeah, uh, we, we've been there two times with uh, the band stopping by. Uh, obviously, we play a lot of concerts in Krakow and this is very close to Krakow. It's a place I always recommend our crew members and band members to go and visit. And uh, even though the second time we came there, I choose not to go inside. I think that one time in this place is enough. It leaves you with uh, with serious scars after you come out, that's for sure. When we wrote the song, we thought we'd seen so many documentaries, we read so much about Auschwitz that we we thought we could sort of be prepared to what we're going to face. Yeah. I mean, both me and Joachim talked about this so many times afterwards that you can't get prepared for this because... Mm-hmm. No matter how much you think you know about it, no, no matter how much you think that you are sort of prepared yourself, um, you, you are absolutely zeroed out when, yeah. you, when you start to walk around there. And when you walk out of there, you, you have, there's no, not anything left in you. And that's why the reason is I had no reason to go in there and feel this again. I encourage the other guys to go inside. But I, I wouldn't go inside myself a second time. And um, then just writing the song in the first place, I mean, it is a heavy topic, sure. But it is also to some a controversial topic. You know there are Holocaust deniers out there. You know there's people out there that when well when you wrote the song, did you get reception? Did you get critique from you know from we we get as uh, as there can be sometimes with Sabaton, there can be people who say, "Oh, you are profiting from this, or you you write a song to become popular about this." There are there are angles that people try to sort of attack the band Sabaton for what we are doing. Again, we are telling history and we are keeping it alive, and uh, we we choose, of course, not to see that we are in any way you know, promoting anything that we are singing about in the terms of, you know, we, we're just saying this happened. Yeah. But we, we had a lot of people who got upset when we did this song. Okay. And uh, I think that uh, that people get upset with it. it shows the power of the topic. Yeah. And uh, in one way, I think that it should just be very clear and not disputed, but it is. Well, what about... Well, as you said, you're you're telling the story of what happened. What about people that say, "No, it didn't happen"? What about them? What? Did, how did? I mean, they obviously get upset for a completely different reason. Yeah, they get upset for a, uh, for a different reason, and we had we have seen a couple of those comments as well. But in the comment section, sometimes this uh, it gets quite nasty when somebody tells like that, yeah. and uh, the f- continuation of the comments is um, leading off and into a sort of war. It's that kind of song. Okay. Well, I personally am glad that you write songs about glad. That's not what I mean, but you know what I mean. I think it's important that you write songs about even the absolute darkest parts of our history. Um, And on that note, I'm going to say goodbye for today. Never forget. Thank you for watching Sabaton History Channel.